Good evening. I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues at the National Institute for Communicable Disease, and we are pleased to be able to share our experience of surveillance and public health measures adopted in South Africa in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. South Africa is the country hardest hit by COVID-19 in Africa. To date, almost 3 million cases and 90,000 deaths have been reported, although these figures are likely hugely undercounted due to challenges with testing and access to health services. The South African Medical Research Council have reported 262,000 excess deaths since the pandemic began, and it is estimated that 85% of these deaths are due to COVID. The country's COVID response is led by a national command council, advised by an incident management team and various ministerial advisory councils. During the three waves of the pandemic, we had had a variety of alert level responses, restrictions and lockdowns. My talk today focuses on the work of the NICD and other institutions in South Africa that helped to inform these responses. At the start of the pandemic, as we saw cases rise in other countries, South Africa adopted the WHO case definition for testing, developed PCR testing capacity, and accredited 203 public and 32 private laboratories across the country. Testing data from both sectors, including PCR and antigen tests, feed into a national data warehouse and are reported daily. This allows us to monitor the percentage testing positive. And in this example from August of this year, you can see how we were able to track the rising third wave until its peak in the week 27 and then monitor as it passed its peak. The weekly trend in percentage testing positive at sub-national level also allows us to track hotspots as resurgences occurred and as the wave settled. The NICD and National De Department of Health release national and provincial SARS-CoV-2 case data daily. The surveillance serves as an early warning for resurgence and has enabled us to track the pandemic as it evolved across the country, as different provinces were affected at different times and at different heights of the wave. The data allows some analysis of age and sex distribution of cases. Higher numbers of cases have been reported in females, and the 40 to 59 age group were most affected across all waves, although case incidence was high in individuals over 60 years in the second wave and in teenagers in the third wave. The NICD also established a national hospital surveillance system in March last year to track COVID admissions. At the time, there was no existing national surveillance system, hospital information system, or electronic health record across the country. The hospital surveillance was expanded to include modules for care home surveillance, for a pediatric registry of admissions, to record out of hospital deaths, a long COVID follow-up study, fields to monitor vaccine breakthrough admissions and deaths, and a module to monitor hospital bed occupancy. DATCOM used the WHO case report form, but adapted it to allow for swift and minimum reporting during busy wave periods. And so the only fields that were included were demographic data, vaccination status, comorbidities, complications, treatment, and hospital outcomes. DATCOM now receives data from 408 public hospitals and 258 private hospitals across the country. To date, over 430,000 admissions and 90,000 deaths have been reported to DATCOV. And despite the public sector catering for 84% of the population, there have been roughly equal numbers of admissions in the public and private sector in each wave. However, a greater number of deaths were recorded in the public sector in each wave. There is a variation in mortality between the public and private sector and between provinces. The case fatality ratio varies from 18% in the Northwest and Western Cape province to 35% uh, in the Eastern Cape, Limpopo and Mpumalanga provinces. Multivariate analysis showed risk factors associated with mortality included male sex, older age, non-white race, and comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, chronic cardiac and kidney disease, malignancy, HIV, and TB. Reporting on COVID mortality has been a challenge in South Africa, particularly at the start of the pandemic, when provinces were expected to manually collect and report numbers of deaths daily to the National Department of Health. That daily report yielded 83,000 deaths on the 4th of September, while the hospital surveillance reported 89,000 deaths. 
that the difference in the deaths was because of undercounting of home deaths and provinces not reporting deaths diagnosed in other provinces. Uh, the MRC reported at the same day 250 excess, uh, thousand excess deaths. So because of this huge discrepancy in reported COVID-19 deaths, the NICD, National Department of Health and MRC are working with provinces to develop a streamlined uniform method of death reporting through DATCOV that will record both hospital and out of hospital deaths. Our team also established a hospital surveillance project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in July of 2020. We employed uh, surveillance nurses and collected enhanced data on 3,200 COVID admissions in 16 public hospitals around the country. Um, one of the useful findings from the study was the proportion of undiagnosed and poorly controlled comorbidity. Among patients admitted with COVID and tested for comorbidities, 29 were newly diagnosed with TB, 87 with HIV, and a large number had severe viremia and low CD4. 215 were newly diagnosed with diabetes and 76% of diabetics were poorly controlled. 40 were newly diagnosed with hypertension and 39% of patients were found to be obese. Um, what this data has shown us is that we get a better understanding of the interaction of COVID-19, non-communicable diseases and chronic infectious disease like HIV and TB. And it's also provided, not, it would not have been possible to get this level of data through our national surveillance of all 666 hospitals. But using dedicated staff in 16 hospitals and a sentinel surveillance approach, this complemented our national surveillance data well. NICD is also a part of the net network of genomic surveillance in South Africa. This network has done sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 samples each week to characterize the predominant virus lineages circulating. As you can see, ancestral lineages predominated in the first wave, the beta variant in the second wave, and de delta variant in the third wave. We used wave period as a proxy for circulating variant, and a multivariate analysis showed increased association with mortality for patients admitted in the second wave when beta variant circulated compared to the first wave. The analysis also showed higher mortality in weeks with high loads of admission, showing the burden on the South African system at the peaks of the wave. Another area of surveillance at the NICD is focused on wastewater. SARS-CoV-2 virus is excreted in stool of persons with active and recovered COVID-19 and can be detected in wastewater. And this gives us a good idea of caseloads and geographical distribution of cases and can be detected in wastewater before the clinical cases appear. Here is an example of one district in Gauteng where wastewater prevalence tracks very well with lab confirmed uh, cases. The NICD and other organizations in South Africa have conducted a number of seroprevalence studies. The healthcare utilization and seroprevalence survey revealed a seroprevalence of 47% by the end of the second wave. This estimate checks well with other seroprevalence studies done in the second wave, particularly the one done by the South African National Blood Service. The healthcare utilization and seroprevalence survey the, NICD conducted a prospective hospital uh, household study of SARS-CoV-2 incidence, transmission, and reinfection in South Africa. 71,000 na nasal swabs were tested between July uh, 2020 and March 2021. 34% of individuals and 73% of households had at least one infection. 83% of infection, as a, uh, infection episodes were asymptomatic. 16% of susceptible household contacts acquired infection with beta variant four times more infectious than the wild type virus and 3% had repeat infections. With funding again from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, our team embarked on a long COVID follow-up study. Using an ICERIC protocol in collaboration with 14 countries, we aim to characterize physical and psychosocial consequences in patients with post-COVID-19 infection. The patients were randomly selected and contacted telephonically at 1, 3, 6, and 12 months, where questions were asked around new and persistent symptoms, quality of life, and changes in employment and activities of daily living. At one month, 82% of patients had persistent symptoms, and this decreased at three months to 62% of patients reporting persistent symptoms. The most commonly reported symptoms were fatigue in 42% of patients, shortness of breath, confusion, and headache. 
on multivariate analysis, factors associated with new or persistent symptoms after hospitalization were female sex, non-Black race, admission in ICU, the presence of four or more acute symptoms during the COVID illness, and pre-existing obesity. We also conducted sentinel surveillance in 45 long-term care facilities. 2,200 cases were reported in the three waves, 1,500 in residents and 820 in staff. 141 deaths were reported, 137 in residents and four in staff. An encouraging trend was the decrease in the number of cases and outbreaks that were reported in the second and third wave at a time when there were large uh, uh, numbers of cases uh, in the country nationally. And this is probably as a result of improved protocols for prevention and case management that were instituted after the first wave. The NICD are an important stakeholder in the National Modeling Consortium, and this focus over the three waves for modeling has evolved. In wave one, modeling data was used to provide insights on uh, predicting various scenarios. The facility readiness cluster was supported on predicting hospital beds, staff, drug quantities, oxygen and ventilation, and the need for surge beds and field hospitals. Some early challenges were uncertainty in predictions due to lack of local data, while the understanding of the disease was still growing. In wave two, the modeling proved useful for monitoring resurgence, but again, the challenges were uncertainty in predicting the effects of drivers of resurgence, particularly the emergence of new variants whose characteristics were unknown. In modeling waves three and four, the impact of variants and vaccines are more significant, and the modeling framework needs to cater for new variants, reinfection, and vaccination coverage. And again, to predict resurgences and a possible fourth wave, local data is imperative. A critical role for NICD is not just generating data, but sharing these insights. All the data is shared on the NICD website and the media as dashboards and daily and weekly reports. We also have uh, re released a number of publications in local and international journals, and all data have been shared in the media and by key players in the COVID response. It has been a busy year um, with bringing with it many challenges, but we have also seen unprecedented developments in surveillance, collaboration across sectors, and pooling of skills and resources. On reflecting on the South African experience, particularly our work at NICD, what we learned was that it was important to scaffold national and, and sentinel surveillance programs and research projects to provide key data that answered important questions for pandemic control. For the South African and low and middle income country context, you need a simple system with a good fit to technological and human resources. And what we demonstrated was that such a system could be designed and implemented even in a short time frame necessitated by a rapidly evolving epidemic. Ownership and buy-in were ensured by, in, by, by providing data in real time to inform actions and strategies. Implementation relied on stakeholders in provinces who steered rollout and individuals in health facilities who understood the value of data. Collaboration with local and international stakeholders such as WHO and ICERIC and funders allowed us to move from vision to implementation in a short time frame. Reliable data provided critical insights and considerable efforts around analysis and knowledge dissemination ensured data was used for action. One of the most important priorities is to improve vaccine coverage. Uh, to date, 3 million doses have been administered and 22% of the population are fully vaccinated. There are wide differentials in vaccination coverage across provinces and between age groups that need to be addressed. While our cause for concern locally is vaccine hesitancy, we cannot ignore that globally, vaccine nationalism is a huge threat for low and middle income countries in effectively dealing with the pandemic. I hope that these few insights from the South African experience have been useful and invite you to contact me if you have any further questions or opportunities to share and collaborate further. Thank you.